All right. So to sum the first part of chapters 1 through 11. So the question is, how can I possibly evangelize? without forcing my religion on someone. Very sensitive, especially because of all of the cultural history. You have to try to... The history of thought is so fascinating. Why is it that that, that, that question is so powerful for us? Why is it so relevant? Yeah. Why why is it so powerful in the minds of everyone around us? Because it's um, it's on everyone's minds as far as like it's in the news and it's in on people's Facebook feeds and people are constantly criticizing each other for uh, pushing their beliefs on each other and so it's Plus, I think people are a lot more sensitive to something like, if you're living a lifestyle that you shouldn't be, you're going to be super sensitive to any other lifestyle that is saying that that is wrong. Um, so there's a higher sensitivity to it. Mm -hmm. Both of you give descriptions as to it's why it's powerful in terms of the efficient cost. People have generated this, or it's effective. What about historically? That's why I love Pope Benedict. Would Pope Benedict would look at that, and he would say, hmm, <laughs> where did this come from? This is the question. And that's something I, I use this as an example, because I want you to gain from this class more than a knowledge of acculturation, which is really not that complicated. I want you to to gain the ability to think in context. That question is not held by many other cultures and places. An example of it being held in our case, on their plane, the famous professor of whatever she wants to call, you know, whatever, who was doing nothing but imposing her truth on the lady next to her. Who, by the way, shamefully, 75 years old or so, was agreeing with her, probably because there was no way around it. This lady was just bombarding her with opinion and as fact. That woman said the following, a child should, not, should be allowed to change its gender all the way up until puberty. As a matter of fact, they should be encouraged by their parents and paid for. For example, a boy who thinks he's a girl is a girl because he thinks so. And if you try to tell them him that he's a boy, you are guilty of a grave crime. What if I think I'm a giraffe? These are the arguments. <laughs> The fact is that, that that could actually be the next step. What if you think that you're not human? What if you think that you should die when you're 13? We enable that in Belgium. You can kill yourself at age 13 without parental consent. Your parents can't stop you. You have the right to kill yourself. When did they Th this only exists in a post-Christian world. Put yourself in, in a Buddhistic society, Hindu society, you'd have a different set of questions. Put yourself in a Muslim society, different set of questions. Jewish society, different set of questions. 
What I just want to point out to you is this question, how can I possibly evangelize without forcing my religion on someone else? Oh my gosh, it wasn't even thought of by the Spanish when they forced their religion on other people. Charlemagne, actually not all the time, but there's different cases where he forced their conversion. You either convert to Christianity or we kill you. <laughs> that was good old Charlemagne, year 800. Right now he wasn't all the way that, but like, what was going on in his brain? And what oftentimes happens is we just kind of say they were barbarians, uh, and that's from Darwin. Darwin taught us to believe that man's thinking today is superior because man's brain has evolved over time, such that we are actually superior human beings to these primate kind of people, basically, who went before us, like Charlemagne. Interesting. Why is it that we look down upon the people of the past? This is an incredible book I point out to you in passing by G.K. Chesterton called The Everlasting Man. I don't want to read that. I don't want to read that. It wouldn't surprise me if you brought it. it because what he does is he goes along, the whole first half is him critiquing evolution, saying we have this theory of cavemen walking around basically beating their wives with a stick. Where did this come from? When I look at antiquity, I don't see evidence of cavemen. It's true, Brother Mary Sean was telling you about the different, uh, how the, the same the construction of the pyramids we find with the Incas. And if you link, and he was talking about what, three or four of these various sites, they all point to the exact same point on the earth. I mean, Long before Christopher Columbus, we knew that the world was not flat. It was the Greeks that discovered that it was round. It's a myth. People thought the world was flat. We just didn't know where the map went. But that the world was round was proven by absolute mathematical geniuses whose math continues to hold the test of time. Um, and then you can keep on going down the line. I love just to look back at the writings of antiquity and see the same thing. You bail wolf. That's the tip of heart. It's my heart. It's the same thing. Big monster man who goes off to slay man, you know? So that's just, I say that only in passing. It's to conjecturalize this. This question is not a normal question. We take it as a normal question. But always realize that thought is shaped by time and experiences. When I ask this question, for example, what I'm realizing is cultural, what I'm assuming is cultural sensitivity. And it's a cultural sensitivity that says we must not change cultures. And tell that to the Romans. <laughs> and, and, and you'd be really hard pressed to say that the Romans were like some sort of like evil, terrible people. They invented law. They invented law. But the law under the Romans reached an apogee. It's just like, their system of law is what's dominated our entire world. And they invented it. And they didn't go around being sensitive to cultures. They smashed that. Why should I not change cultures? This is the great question. And Because you could say, for example, is this even possible that we must not change cultures? Because when you say this, you're imposing a culture. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's a cultural mechanism. Your language must not use these words. But it may use these words. In fact, it must use these words. And who determines what's yours? For example, you must not say that there's a difference between whites and blacks. But you must say that there is no difference between uh, people who are homosexual and people who are heterosexual. You violate those laws, you have demonstrated that you are not of our culture. And that actually you're an inferior culture. And we're going to impose that upon you by the various mechanisms. And there's punishments entailed for this. You're just, it's just, the point I'm pointing out is that whenever you hear the type of idea that we have an enlightened neutrality, the great just expression, and you hear this all the time. I was listening my little friend on the plane, who was really taking this type of 
invite neutrality as if like the only way is to respect everybody and she was not respecting me she was not respecting anyone who had anything different to say that hurts blatant neutrality is a falsehood I, I point you to a dialogue that I had with the editor the chief editor editor in chief of the foreign news department at the New York Times extremely he was actually one of the six people that decided what goes on the front page of the New York Times. So, like, New York Times is the number one authority in news in the world. So if you publish it in the Times, it means it's going to get published in tens of thousands of other markets that just subscribe to the Times and put their stuff in their papers because the Times is all the work. They do this high-quality journalism. And I remember I asked him, is it possible that newspapers be objective? Actually, it took Eagle Eye to see him. So it's kind of cool. Eagle Eye was in a tour of the New York Times, and he led us through. Can you really say that news is objective? He says, of course not. There's no such thing as objectivity. We at the New York Times, he said, belong to the benevolent left. We are not radically left, but we're definitely left with an openness to truth. He was able to pinpoint the tone and was actually openly saying, this is what we do. If you don't like that, buy another paper. That was what he was saying. And I thought that, that was fascinating because what he was actually recognizing is truth here. This is a culture. The idea of saying you must not change culture is a cultural matrix through which culture is formed. You always are imposing upon another person. So the idea to say we must not change cultures is not only a fallacy, but it's also an impossibility. It's a fallacy because you're imposing a culture, and it's an impossibility because you're always going to be imposing cultures. The reason why this cultural sensitivity, though, reigns, even though it's both a fallacy and an impossibility, I think, comes from World War II where you had a clear annihilation of a culture by another in a horrific, violent way to which we bore witness as we then dropped the bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, annihilating 200,000 civilians ourselves. And then when people get mad because Trump's like, what, you don't think we have rear killers too? People are like, we can't believe you said that. Well, we annihilated civilians. No, we dropped it on an, ar a bomb, a, an armament factory. <laughs> that was the excuse. We killed 200,000 innocent civilians, our country. I happen to agree with the dropping of the bomb, by the way. But I only agree based upon what I know. So I'm not saying it's an evil thing. But I'm pointing out that we killed 200,000 civilians. And there's all kinds of it's a neat little thing for you to kind of research if you're bored. On YouTube, there's lots of cool talks. There's actually an interview with the guy who dropped the bomb like 50 years later, and he's like this old man living in Southern California in like this little house on a retirement pension. And he was the guy who was on the flight who dropped the bomb. And he said, would you do it again? He said, absolutely. Do you think it was a problem? Not at all. And the reason was all the reasons of the war. Now, the church has always said, you may never target civilians, period. So maybe my opinion is like outside of the gospel, but it's, in terms of a debate, a lot of validity for having dropped it. The point of that is that that totally, we were ignorant of that, right? we just ignore that. And the reason we ignore it is because in the cultural matrix of our time it was a huge consolation. Because the, the, the Japanese were going to uh, fight us to the death. And we would have had to lose all kinds of more of our people by invading the island. And so dropping the bomb was actually Truman supposedly saying this will save lives kill these lives, but it'll actually save them. Because otherwise we would have to invade Japan, and there's all kinds of videos of them training, you know, housewives use knives to kill the Americans. And there was this incredible, like, hatred against the Americans, like a racism that was being pumped into the people so that we would have had to, we would have had just a war on our hands the whole way through. And so Truman said this is the shortest way to actually save lives. And so, 
regardless of what it was, and I just point that out in passing, World War II, I think, shocked us, the Constitution Party. It's because right after World War II, you have all these soldiers that go home, and there's very interesting studies that have been done, like books that have been written about this, with before psychology was there to train PTSD, you just seen World War II. So all these guys are now the dads. They come back from war and they start the family, the baby boom generation. And they're all carrying trauma from the war that's untreated. And so you have this generation of dads that actually give birth to the kids in the 60s who rebel. There's all kinds of things that follow into that. But the, what are they saying? We can't live like this anymore. So we're going to have no structures, no whatever. And so that at the same time, in terms of our broadening of communications, we learn so much more about the world. We see how other people live. We're so the Vietnam War becomes politicized. And so it's used as a mechanism against government. And we have ingrained in our brains, you know, make love, not war. And so I have to, therefore, have this cultural sensitivity because if I change cultures, I'm like a Nazi. Oh, that's exactly what he said. So you're a Nazi for telling people about Jesus. You're a Nazi for saying that homosexuality is intrinsically disordered. You're a Nazi for all kinds of things. Why am I always a Nazi? He goes back to this. This is a little theory. I could show you if I wanted to the whole history of, of cultural sensitivity in terms of thought. I'm just going to evoke a few things to kind of like point out this basic question of how much we're basing our class. How can I possibly evangelize without forcing my religion on someone is a bogus question. The only reason you ask it is because you have a whole set of assumptions that have been given to you that make evangelization somehow intrinsically a bad thing. Because once you start with this question, what are you actually doing? You actually have to say, prove to me, prove to me that evangelization is legitimate. Whoa. If you can first prove to me that's legitimate, then I'll do it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing where the burden of proof is? But in most of our brains, it is that way. I have to have whole sessions on how, we were just, I was just up in, in uh, Fort Collins, and I was visiting with this program called Justice for All. And Justice for All is does nothing more, it puts pictures up of aborted children and the cross of abortion, and also very beautiful pictures of different things, on the college campus, right in the middle of the quad. And then they have uh, trained students that interact with the students to just simply have conversations. And you have to have, the goal is nothing more than to have a conversation. Get to know the people, to share, to listen, to heal. They have to train the volunteers that it's okay to go up to someone and talk to them. The burden of proof, in other words, is not on is it right or wrong, and it's not on why shouldn't I evangelize, it's why should I. And that comes because our culture has a set of assumptions. Other cultures don't have that assumption. It's just kind of interesting. Comments on that. Uh, they had a wall up, which just, they just said opinion wall, write anything you want, free speech wall. And 75% of the comments were extremely virulently pro-choice, just like, just arrogant, horrible things. Mm -hmm. They said that in conversations, you almost never have violence. A person might be upset, but by simply listening and dialoguing with them, they, that's their whole idea. So they don't just have uh, uh, violent images. Most of them are beautiful, and then they throw in a few that are violent. But the idea is to spark the conversation. What I think is interesting about it is that that idea of sparking a conversation is not even really seen as welcome. Other cultures, it's a lot more welcome. France, for example... 
They love to debate. They pick fights on purpose. So if, it, if a conversation is too, like, getting along, they're bored. So then they just start attacking you until they get a fight going. Because they actually appreciate. Sometimes they'll even take the other side that's on purpose because they like to think. And we in America don't have that same culture. Yeah, I didn't turn around and engage that professor, but in another culture, I would have, or I could have. I could have in our culture as well, but it would have been seen as such a, a confrontation, and I just didn't feel like the, spending the energy doing it. Plus, you can't get off the plane. Yeah, and plus, I think I would have lost in the eyes of everyone around me. I would have been the big bad gorilla. Because immediately, the conversation was degraded from intelligence to affectivity. How can you say that? It's so hateful. Don't you respect people? And then I'd have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and just start yelling back at her and not listening to her like she's out to me, and, and, and I hate that. Mm -hmm. So I just avoid it. I get angry. I decide to go instead of just running. But other cultures, that wouldn't be the case. But other cultures, think of like older people. Older people would have been like, what? Now, how can you be saying this? Now, you just keep your voice down if you're going to be on a plane. I don't know. I don't mind. Different world. So all, I guess I, I want to just point out to you that is that legitimate? That you have to prove to the person that you're allowed to evangelize. When you say that, you mean like the person, the person you're trying to evangelize, like they're like prove to me that this is legitimate or the person that is doing the evangelism? has to decide that evangelization is legitimate. If, if you're going to ask the question, how can I possibly evangelize without forcing my religion, it shows that already you feel like we should be silent and you have to justify why you should speak. Okay. Other people, cultures, it's you should speak and you need to justify why you shouldn't. Christ didn't have any problem saying go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, and them. He didn't have a problem with that. The Jews didn't have a problem with it. The Romans and everyone at that time was very much engaged in trying to bring people into their cause. But we today have enlightened neutrality. No, no, we don't have religions here. That's a religion. <laughs> enlightened neutrality is a fallacy and an impossibility. Always remember that. Okay. So, the question though, that being the question, the first part gave us some great light. And it said, what is culture? And it said that culture is the extension of human nature. So it builds upon everything that's authentically nature in terms of helping that nature reach its perfection. And it does this by being a milieu of action. Cultural milieu, the environment, the set of given presuppositions for our action. The next thing it says that I didn't, we didn't read is that religion is part of human nature and therefore a helpful element in human culture. And there's lots of ways to debate that. Said about it, but that's something that the church has always said. If you look at seven, paragraph seven, culture, which is always a concrete and particular culture, it's very always, there's no enlightened neutrality. It's always a concrete and particular culture. It's open to the higher values common to all. Thus, the originality of a culture does not signify withdrawal into itself but a contribution to the richness which is the good of all. 
how cool to be able to say that there is a difference in the culture between the African Americans and the white Americans. It'd be neat, because then the white Americans could learn something from the African Americans. But if you say no, there's absolutely no difference, and that the African Americans are basically the same thing as white Americans, well now you've just eliminated all of that wonderful African ways. We just said, because somehow that's inferior. Why should you be ashamed of being African? I think it's wonderful. But I have to be able to say an African is not the same as an American or a white American in order to do that. Well, little is not the same. Well, the, we could say that they act in different ways. They have a different cultural matrix. The role of the woman is different. The role of the man is different. Or, and all that sounds like this incredible racism. And I just say, why? Why is that racist? What is inferior about that? When you go to Africa, they don't have a problem being African. And the reason is because, well, quite frankly, there was abuse, and terrible abuse. And we, the white people, taught the African people that somehow being African was less than being white. I would like to point out that that's Charles Darwin, who is a, was a racist to the core, and who said that we should, we should favor the sterilization of the Africans. And no one wants to say that because Charles Darwin is the enlightened cultural matrix of the world, but like, that's not true. It, I just think it's interesting. So I chose that one, which, of course, like, you always sound bad as soon as you say that. But how cool to be able to say that, that a Swede is different from a Dane, is different from a Lithuanian, is different from an Estonian. Now, all of a sudden, my world becomes rich because I don't see a rivalry between cultures. I see incredible harmony. That's the Catholic vision. Therefore, in the Catholic vision, we're going to accentuate differences hasn't always been done, but that's what should be done. Women are not men. Thank God. Men are not women. Thank God. Children are adults. Thank God. And then, therefore, like, let the Norwegians dress as Norwegians. And let the Madagascarians dress as Madagascar. That's one of the visions GP2 had of World Youth Day. He said he wanted it to be a place where the people saw the world's culture. He wanted to be a celebration of differences of culture so that the young people could see. Oh. I remember seeing a group from the Congo who had never been out of their country before standing in Rome for World Youth Day. And they stood out. Why? Because they were dressed up beautifully. I remember seeing this one girl in red, red shoes and a red dress. She'd never been outside of Congo in her life. They'd gotten scholarships from some international youth and they were like, we're seeing the Holy Father. And there she is, in red, with lipstick and everything. So she's going to see the Holy Father in a little red hat. And I'm just like, and there I am, in shorts and a t-shirt, you know. And well, I wasn't, I was in the habit at the time. But all the other kids, shorts and t-shirts. Like, every one of the Congo Congolese, they had ties and a suit. Why would I want to eradicate that? Why would I want to say that that's less or inferior than me? Only because I've been trained to do so. The people who are manipulating me for their own ends. So that whole silencing of culture is an incredible mind game. Well, it's like one of the reasons I love New York City. Because when you go there, it's like you're it's on jungle. like a boat to get to the ferry to get to the Statue of Liberty. And like there are like people from all different countries and like speaking their languages. And like I think that the cultural aspect of the city like you can go pick any country you want and get like their like real authentic Korean food or like whatever whatever you want African food that diversity is incredible isn't it yeah mm -hmm. and that that's all great you almost want it to be different so you can explore the other and see the, the Chinese way you know yeah and that's what I just think is really interesting so why wouldn't we say that Christianity is really cool too and that a Christian culture deserves to be spread part of it's because will it only be spread by destroying the other cultures that's the question the great thing about Christianity is no every culture can assimilate Christianity on its own and come up with Christian expression in its culture because Christianity is not first of all a culture 
So that's where we're going to go. So he talks about this. It's kind of cool, though. Uh, number seven, cultural pluralism cannot therefore be interpreted as a juxtaposition of a closed universe to worlds side by side but as a participation in the unison of all rea of realities all directed towards the universal God, which is Jesus. Phenomenon of the reciprocal penetration of cultures illustrates the fundamental openness of particular cultures to value common. Man, and then eight, man is a naturally religious being. So when we see nature naturally, we are religious by nature. Now where does that claim? He just, the church just kind of points to evidence. The turning towards the absolute is inscribed in his deepest being. In a general sense, religion is an integral constituent of culture in which it takes root and blossoms. Moreover, all the great cultures include as a keystone of the edifice that constitutes the religious mission. That's true. Religion is present in every great culture. There is no such thing as an atheist culture that, that before now. The inspiration of the great achievements. Of the no, I no, I shouldn't be. I, I called it that because I just was throwing it in there. Okay, section two. First point. Remember, I just said Christianity is a faith, not a culture. Da da da. Pretty smart. That's section two. So now, so we see the problem, and we see great teaching of what culture is. Regina, what is culture? Give me a sentence definition. Ah, that'll transcend your notes. Assimilate the ideas. A culture is a set of beliefs and traditions that define a group of Wow, did you get that from your notes? No, I got that from my brain. <laughs> okay, try to get one from your notes. <laughs> um. Yes, yes, truly, you're a Disney intellect. Or yes, yes, you're very smart. Wow. Um, it's a way of governing? Think. Don't even look at your notes. Just think, I had those four points over here. What did I say about culture? Okay, three. Extension of the individual. But that's not the teaching. That's the point. That's the first element to make sure I got your notes. Yeah. And try to put a new sentence together. You can look at your notes, combine those four ideas for me great exercise. It's a steam and neurons firing. Just think you could have had a street lecture if only someone hadn't complained. Because she complained, she now has to jump through hoops. So then we could go to the board. It's a kinesthetic knowledge. That's what they call it. Some people then that So, culture is a atmosphere Good. that brings out your human nature and so that it reaches its perfection. And religion... No, it's okay. All I wanted was that. Bree, how about you? That's exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gosh, the gun came in hard. You're going to let you off the hook. <laughs> All right, so that's a pretty good idea. Okay. So now, this being said, that's point one, chapter two, is starts off by Christ is not a culture. That is what's going to enable us to have the grounding for enculturation. Wait, so were we going to do the presence of Christ, the culture? Uh, page two. Q 
Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior of the world, who okay. transcended the Jesus Christ relationship to all culture. So what I did is I cut off paragraphs one to seven and just gave you eight. Okay. So there's more to this document. Bree, how about the paragraph? sovereign light and true wisdom for all nations and all cultures. He shows in his own activity that the God of Abraham, already recognized by Israel as creator and Lord, is preparing himself to reign over all those who believe in the gospel, and much more through Jesus, God already reigns. Keep on going. You're not doing much. The teaching of Jesus, notably in the parables, is not afraid to correct or when he needs, or when the need arises, to challenge a good number of the ideas which history, religion as practice and culture, religion as practice and culture had inspired among his contemporaries concerning the nature and action of God. The completely filial intimacy of Jesus with God and the loving obedience which has caused him to offer his life and death to his father. Show that in him the original plan of God for creation, tainted by sin, has been restored. We are faced with a new creation, a new Adam. Also, the relationships with God are profoundly right, changed. Let's go to page three. <laughs> Christ is not a culture. The idea that the church is trying to make, or that this thing is trying to make, it's really bad, is that Christ. Um, addresses all, all men and Christ and, and more than addresses Christ um, shares a nature common to all men and therefore his message and his human humanity are both able to transcend any given culture. So to say that Christ is a Jew is true. But to say that Christ is only Jewish is false. Even though he only practiced Judaism. So what other culture was it? Well, it's that because he's human, he's bigger than all. And we can say that about everybody, which is why all of us need to incorporate other cultures. There's no, even the great Ohio culture, <laughs> the culture of the great state of Ohio, as great as it is, it's pretty sad if you've never left Ohio. If all you've done is Ohio. Football games, Dairy Queen. shoveling snow and your kids. It's all charming, but there's a lot we could learn if you miss out on it. Yeah. Let's go to something a little more exciting. Page 3, Bree. The uniqueness of Christ. Since it was fully and historically realized, the incarnation of the Son of God was a cultural incarnation. Christ Ooh. found himself in virtue of his incarnation Whoa. Certain social and cultural conditions of those human beings Whoa. among whom he dwelt. That's huge. We're all laying it down, starring that. The in, by the incarnation, the incarnation was a cultural one. So on the one hand, you have a transcendence. And on the other hand, you have an incarnation. If Jesus came to Ohio, man, marketing opportunity would be incredible. Ohio would be the Holy Land. <laughs> wow. Can you imagine? And like, no. Buckeyes would have been like, these are the Buckeyes of Virgin Mary made. <laughs> you know, before Christmas. They'd become like, she fed these to baby Jesus, you know? Like, isn't that ridiculous? St. Joseph would like have like a Buckeyes sweatshirt on and his statues. He 
you holding my lily? You have like go box. You know? <laughs> 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 the, the presentation at the temple would have become like you know a, a tailgating party at you know. Candy over the trophy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> But the fact is, he really was Jew at this time. So he was an Israelite. Well, we all go to Israel. He dressed like them. He talked like them. He spoke like them. He was from Nazareth. And he wasn't from Bethlehem. Okay. Okay. The Son of God was happy to be a Jew of Nazareth in Galilee, speaking Aramaic, subject to pious parents of Israel accompanying them to the temple of Jerusalem, where they found him, sitting among the doctors, listening to them, and asking them questions. Jesus grew up in a milieu of customs and institutions of first century Palestine, initiating himself into the trades of his time, observing the behavior of the sinners, peasants, and business people of his milieu. The scenes and countrysides on which the imagination of the future rabbi was nourished are of a very definite country and time. Nourished by the piety of Israel, formed by the teaching of the law and the prophets, to which a completely singular experience of God as Father added an unheard of profundity. Jesus may be situated in a highly specific spiritual tradition, that of Jewish prophecy. Like the prophets of old, he is the mouthpiece of God and calls to conversion. The manner is also quite typical. The vocabulary, literary types, the manner of address also recall the tradition of Elijah and Elisha. Elisha? Mm -hmm. The biblical parallelism, the proverbs, paradoxes, admonitions, admonitions, blessings, right up to the symbolic action. Jesus is so bound up with the life of Israel that the people in the religious tradition in which he shares acquire in virtue of this liaison a unique place in the history of salvation. The chosen people in the religious tradition which they have left have a permanent significance for humanity. There is nothing improvised about the incarnation. The word of God enters into a history which prepares him announces him and prefigures him. One could say that the Christ takes flesh in advance with the people God has expressly has expressly formed with a new with a view to the gift he would make of his son. All the words uttered by the prophets are a prelude to the subsistent word which is the Son of God. Also the history of the covenant concluded with Abraham and through Moses with the people of Israel, as also the books which recount and clarify this history, all together hold for the faithful of Jesus the role of an indispensable and irreplaceable pedagogy. Moreover, the election of this people from which Jesus emerges has never been revoked. All right, so what's the point of that? so important that Jesus was specifically a Jew. Why does that, what does that tell us? Why do you think it's important? Regardless of the right.
baby Moose that he had all of this. Why is, what's the point to all of this? Why is he making this big deal? They say that he taught like Jews in the Old Testament. Parallelism, Proverbs, paradoxes, admonitions. He dressed like them. He was fascinated by the way the businessmen acted and the, the way that the poor people acted. He describes them. A businessman did this. He hired this off. A poor person did this. Why does Christ care about this? So that the culture he was a part of was like the chosen people of God and so he like similar to their lifestyle and like that and it's kind of just reminding but like he, he uniquely experienced his humanity through that culture okay and why is that important for you and me? What spiritual lesson would you draw from this about you? Oh, Regina of Hamilton. Oh, millennial female of Hamilton. I don't think you want me to assimilate to the culture of Hamilton. <laughs> Are you? that it's okay to belong to a culture? Yeah. How much? Like, why wouldn't you want to be a, 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 a Hamilton? Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian. <laughs> I did not see that. <laughs> I'm the one that told her it was called Hamiltonian. <laughs> noble about Hamilton? What's great about it? Um, well, I think that there's a lot of people in Hamilton that are dedicated to kind of like bringing the bringing the city back to how it used to be. It kind of like went downhill, but like people are really making efforts to like revive the city. Um, so I think would you want to be a part of that group? Yeah, I don't want Hamilton to die. It's where I grew up. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, that's cool. And what makes? What are you proud of? You're proud of that fact that it's mainly in the south. Is there anything special about Hamilton and the Hamilton area? Unique. <laughs> the um, fact that that can prom night is one drives. What do you call the McDonald's parking lot full of crackers? Prom night. <laughs> okay, it's not like that. <laughs> Prom night, Rishi. Uh, I remember being out in Salina. We have a heroine. And a whole group of eight out of the ten kids were not going to college. They were taking all their dad's class. That was my life. Wow, they really did. I think that we have the one of the highest rates of Addictions in the country. Right, so you're not getting it. <laughs> the value to what he's saying can be eloquently demonstrated by the life of John Paul II. You'll be hard pressed to find a more proud Pole than him. Did that for a moment think he, mean he didn't like America or Nicaragua or Paraguay? I'd say there's a lot of pride in being American. Three. I usually don't pick on you because you get all mad when I, when I ask you questions. But that was amazing. The foundational thing in what way? Um, in the way that it's, you know, what, I mean, your culture that you grew up in is what um, kind of gave you your background. 
microphone of truth, and then from there, it's allowed you to, to grow and experience what you've always experienced. When is it wrong to love your culture? When does it grow wrong? Regina's almost going into the silent zone. <laughs> if it's coming. Bree, give me some light here. She's too far gone. <laughs> I just want exams to be done. If it's causing you um, to build walls to keep people out rather than to bring people in. Cool. Did you absolutely right? The fact that the Pope was Polish actually made him more open to the Germans. The fact that some people are very proud of the Pope <coughs> Vito actually makes them more open to <laughs> Hamasakian. Why? Because at the root of every culture is the human heart. The deeper you go into a culture, the more you experience a commonality with others. The problem isn't the culture. The problem is when you take that culture as a defense. A defense. Yeah. Because I think that the more that you're really in your roots, the more that you're outward focused. I think otherwise what you do is you just are actually stay, you're not in your culture, you're using it as a sword. Because Christ being Jew, does that mean that the Egyptians are evil? No. If he's really Jewish, then he'll love the Egyptians. Okay. Last one. I think the sword reference makes sense in the So if you're if you're more proud of your culture to the core of who you are. Have the culture to the core you are. You're less likely to need a defense because it's at the very center. Whereas if it's only an exterior thing, then that's where it's your weapon. Yeah. You got it. Almost every single thing. Yeah, absolutely. Great job. <laughs> for, for whatever name. Bring it. Okay. Alright, well, 35 after. Um, what I want you to get out of this is the fact that Christ really was Jewish, the importance of that is to show that we should really be our cultures. And that that's not a problem. It actually is unity, because at the root of my culture is me. And I have a commonality with all of us. I, was, I, guess, I guess it's almost like, if you don't have a food to celebrate, then you'll never celebrate food. If you don't have a dress that's distinctive, then you won't appreciate anyone else's. Yeah. If you don't root for the Buckeyes, then you'll root for the Wolverines. We don't have those people here. Yeah. If you notice, there's never been a Michigan student. <laughs> I don't know what I'll do when the first one applies. I guess I'll just discriminate against them. I think you like, why is Megan? I'll be like, you're from Michigan. Well, I mean, if they're like a Buckeye, I mean, maybe they could be a convert. Oh. We could we can convert them. We could evangelize them. Yeah. Let them know that their culture is not wrong. Yes. <laughs> there we go. We can engage them aggressively. All right. Well,